So today we move on from the depth psychology of uh, Sigmund Freud to uh, Virginia Woolf, one of the great novelists of the 20th century, a writer who uh, expanded the boundaries of her genre, uh, a writer whose, uh, whose sensitivity to politics and to family life and to aesthetics and philosophy uh, was uh, really extraordinary while at the same time her ability to uh, tell a story that was intensely moving and uh, eye-opening uh, uh, has rarely been seen in the history of literature. Certainly To the Lighthouse, one of the, one of the great books of the 20th century and a book for our, our purpose, one of the reasons we read it, uh, sure it's experimental in form and I hope you have had a chance to read it and see some of the experiments with form, with point of view, um, uh, but we also read it because it, it, it represents a, a shift away from the concerns of modernism of finding the really real by digging deeper and deeper to some foundation toward um, a, a understanding of, uh, uh, of knowledge as intimacy uh, rather than finding the really real, finding the thing that you can be closest to the person you can be closest to, uh, the uh, phenomena that you can have intimacy with. I hope this becomes clear as we move through the novel. Virginia Woolf, Virginia Woolf was part of a group that uh, has uh, stimulated the imagination of historians and literary critics for a long time, the Bloomsbury Group, and you can uh, go uh, various places online and find out different things about Bloomsbury. It was an extraordinary group of, of uh, of uh, intellectuals and artists and writers who uh, in the beginning decades of the 20th century uh, came together out of friendship and shared uh, political convictions, that is they wanted a society with uh, greater uh, equality and less violence, uh, but most importantly they, um, they shared a commitment to uh, the arts and to aesthetic principles uh, and, and friendship. Some of the people involved in that were, um, uh, of course, Virginia Woolf and her husband Leonard, uh, Clive and Vanessa Bell, uh, John Maynard Keynes, probably the person's name most familiar to most of you from his work in economics, uh, E.M. Forster and Linton Strachey, uh, a, a whole group of artists who, who defied convention in order to expand their art. Um, they, they saw um, middle class morality as uh, hypocritical in many cases and they wanted to go beyond that, although they were very much middle class people, almost all, um, uh, they wanted to go beyond middle class morality, bourgeois morality, uh, go beyond convention in terms of friendship, in terms of sexuality, in terms of art making. Uh, to find something that would be more meaningful uh, and um, uh, less violent and less uh, hypocritical. So Bloomsbury was a nest uh, for Virginia Woolf, uh, a place where she found uh, uh, sustenance and support um, um, and they found some ideas that uh, um, uh, certainly linked the members of this group together and, and the ideas seem to come um, mostly from a philosopher named G. E. Moore, G. E. Moore, who uh, uh, wrote in uh, early days of analytic philosophy, that is a, a philosophy that tries to clarify things by showing what we can count on and what we can't, what, what is an illusion. Uh, and Moore, along with Bertrand Russell, who certainly intersected with folks in this group too, Moore and Russell and, and others, we'll read some Wittgenstein next week, they were responsible for moving philosophy on the whole toward the sciences, towards logic and mathematics, and towards a more precision. But that part of the philosophy wasn't what attracted the Bloomsbury group. What attracted the, the Bloomsbury group to Moore was Moore's uh, ethics and aesthetics, because Moore made the, the argument uh, that um, no scientific or logical uh, deduction of the good uh, would uh, be compelling, would be correct. That, the, that, that the, um, the idea of the good was primary. You couldn't deduce it from other things. 
Um, and so um, uh, the uh, ethics for uh, Moore was not uh, empirical, uh, not, uh, not scientific, um, and um, intrinsic goods, the goods, things that are good in themselves, uh, they don't have to be interrelated. They're not systematic. That's what Moore, and, and to that, the other analytic philosophers did. They showed you what things fell apart as systems and what things held together as systems. And Moore said ethics and aesthetics, they don't actually hold together as systems, or at least the intrinsic goods don't hold together as a system. But that doesn't, and here's where Moore was attractive to Bloomsbury, that doesn't make intrinsic goods any less valuable, or any less good. Um, in fact, the uh, intrinsic goods like friendship, like beauty, um, uh, uh, like uh, um, art, uh, that these um, uh, uh, love, that these intrinsic goods uh, stood on their own and a commitment to them uh, structured your other beliefs rather than your other beliefs leading you to have a commitment to friendship or love or beauty. So Moore was an analytic philosopher, but one of the things he tried to show was that um, uh, no matter how much uh, precision you use, no matter how much uh, uh, scientific, li scientifically uh, organized argument you used, um, you could not actually define uh, the good. And every time we defined the good, we actually were just substituting one thing we liked for the concept of the good. Um, and so for Moore, that was a liberating uh, um, uh, analysis because it, it allowed you to, to say that, um, um, not to prove that your notion of the good was right, uh, but to articulate why you held the notion you did because it could not be disproven by any logical means. It was, a, it was an a assertion uh, of preference not an empirical observation and not a logical deduction. Goodness was indefinable. Goodness is not to, reducible to anything else. And um, uh, you held some things as intrinsically good, but they didn't act, actually have to cohere into a system. And so for Moore, in his ethics, and he's, he's one of the founders of what is now called meta-ethics, um, uh, for more friendship, love, and art became, um, uh, he articulated as core values, core expressions uh, of the good. And for Bloomsbury, uh, this was, um, this, really, this, this, this was the, the, uh, the mother's milk. That, that, that friendship held them together, not because of ideology, not because of religion, but just for friendship, because they loved each other. Um, uh, love was not reducible to anything else, not to happiness, not to pleasure. Love was its own thing, and aesthetics stood alone. Aesthetics wasn't reducible to anything else, and that the, the love of art um, uh, didn't have to satisfy. Didn't have. We didn't have to show you that if you if you did art, it would make you better at math, like as we do in America now, right? If you if you if you learn how to play the piano as a child, you do well in your math SATs, right? Rather than saying, well, learning to play the piano is a good in itself. Oh no, no, no. We 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 do that because it helps you get a job one day, so you can be ha unhappy for most of your life. Um, rather than, like I say, learning to draw actually is a good in itself. Now, learning to draw helps you think, it helps you think, solves problems, solves problems, makes it good for corporation, corporation will hire you, and then you can be unhappy. <laughs> but, um, for, but for these guys, learning to draw, or learning to play the piano, or learning to read a poem, didn't have to be justified in terms of how much money you would make later on. Because actually, no one actually says that making money is the highest good, even in America. They just act as if it and Moore and the Bloomsbury group said, no, no, art is its own thing. It doesn't have to be justified in other terms. So too friendship, so too life. The beginning of To the Lighthouse, as you remember, I'm, I'm going to read mostly from this, this edition, uh, 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 the uh, Harcourt uh, 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 book edition. The, 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 the very beginning of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the novel is this. Yes, of course, if it's fine tomorrow, said Mrs. Ramsey. But you have to be up with the lark, she added. If it's, yes, if it's fine tomorrow, 
her, the mother, Mrs. Ramsey, reassuring her son, reassuring her son, James, that yes, we will go to the lighthouse tomorrow, if it's fine. And the sense of yes, I, the mother, will give you what you need. This reassurance, this comfort he wants so desperately to get in the boat. He's a little boy, go out to the lighthouse. Um, and she provides him with hope, with connection, with assurance, with truth. I mean, she, says, she does say conditionally, if it's fine, uh, if it's fine. But she knows she's supporting his belief. She's supporting belief. And then on this first page of the novel, along comes Mr. Ramsey, the patriarch of the, of the book, a philosopher. Um, and uh, Mr. Ramsey says, uh, but it won't be fine tomorrow. But it won't be fine tomorrow. Here's the voice of science, the voice of uh, knowledge, um, and uh, the voice of disappointment. And that is the structure of the novel. Mrs. Ramsey, the maternal voice, is the voice of reassurance, of belief, of support, of intimacy. The boy is like standing between her legs right in the beginning. She's, they're, they're close physically. And Mr. Ramsey, he's walking around. He's, he's, uh, he's striding. He often has his pipe. Mr. Ramsey is the voice of, of knowledge, of, of objectivity. And uh, this is the these are the structures of the family. Daddy is the voice of reason and law. Mommy, the voice of intimacy. You don't have to be Freud to see the, uh, the Oedipal dynamics at play here, right? And, and Virginia Woolf and her husband Leonard are actually the publishers of Freud in English in, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in England for a long time and still today. Uh, uh, their edition is known as the standard edition. Um, be that as it may. Let's go back to the beginning of the book. The, the, the mother, this, this figure of intimacy, uh, let me just show you a picture of her. She, uh, this is a picture uh, uh, of um, uh, Julia Stephen, Virginia Woolf's mother. Now, she is not Mrs. Ramsey exactly, but she is certainly a model for Mrs. Ramsey. And you'll see Julia Stevens. This is a, a, a photograph by Julia, Julia Margaret Cameron, a great Victorian photographer. Uh, Julia Stevens looks like a pre-Raphaelite beauty here, does she not? She's with her flowing hair and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, inviting uh, personage. Uh, uh, but just, to, just to, to, you'll get a sense of the structuring device when I show you the next photo here of, of Mr. Stephen, uh, Virginia Woolf's father, Leslie Stephen. Um, yeah, he looks uh, scary. He's a scary looking guy. Um, and uh, there are lots of pictures you can find on the web. He himself was uh, uh, writing philosophy or philosophically oriented books um, and was a scholar um, and uh, was uh, left to raise the children when, when uh, Leslie Stephen uh, died uh, at a young age. So these are the what structure of Virginia Woolf's uh, life and what structure uh, to the lighthouse. Uh, I want to go through to, just by talking with you a little bit about some of the key characters and what they're meant to represent for us uh, in terms of the themes of our course. Uh, one of the first characters we uh, are introduced to is, is Mr. Tansley. Uh, you remember Tansley? He's, um, uh, he's a lower class person. He, he always reminds us, right, I am from the lower classes. I don't have uh, uh, the, all the advantages that these Ramsey children have. There are many of them, right? There are many uh, Ramsey kids. Uh, I had to work my way up. I had to work my way up. And uh, this is really important. Uh, in, in, in my class here at Wesleyan, when we talk about this, I try to get our students to say, what, is this, what does class division mean to you today We're at Wesleyan? And, and students talk about the different levels of wealth. Here we have a lot of students on scholarship and who are able to go to school uh, uh, w without paying high tuition. But still, when they're here, there are differences of, of social class, differences of wealth. But most of the time, those are obscured by social life uh, at the university when you're at a residential uh, university, uh, th things often work that way. But in England at the time this novel was written, uh, social class was, 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 was much more uh, visible. And for Tansley it means uh, I have to work for a living. <laughs> uh, I don't have an independent income. An independent income is what sets somebody else free. 